Good morning, and welcome to worship here in our beautiful Woodlawn United Church Sanctuary. I'm Reverend Mary Lynn White, Minister of Woodlawn. Thank you for joining us on this 11th Sunday after Pentecost. This is our second attempt at live streaming. The team working here today is Gus on the keyboards. You just heard the beautiful rendition of our prelude on the piano and on the organ. Thank you, Gus. And we have Steve on sound, Peter on PowerPoint, and Paul behind the camera. Next week, there won't be a Woodlawn service as I will be on study leave. And I'm taking a study leave to plan for the fall, all the themes, scriptures, etc., for the entire fall right until Christmas. However, we would like to encourage you to find another online worship service for August 23rd. But after that, we hope you'll join us for live streaming on Sunday mornings at 10, starting August 30th. We hope to continue live streaming uh, even when we're able to open up our sanctuary for public worship once again, which we hope will be by mid-September, but more on that in the weeks to come. On behalf of Woodlawn United, I'd like to extend Christian condolences to Diane and Terry Barrow and their family on the death of their daughter, Kelly, on July 30th. A private family service will take place on Tuesday, August 25th. As well, I'd also like to extend Christian condolences to Linda Sinclair and her family on the death of Linda's husband, Harold. A private graveside service will take place on Friday, August 21st. And now I'd like to read our Statement of Reconciliation. As we gather in this place, we remember with gratitude that we live and worship on lands that are, by law, the unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq. May we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. Let's begin our worship by singing a hymn from More Voices, number 12, Come Touch Our Hearts.
Lighting the Christ candle reminds us that the loving presence of Christ, the light of the world, is with us at all times. May this Christ candle also remind us that no matter what challenges we face, if we are persistent in seeking Jesus to grow in faith, then the light of Christ will show us the way to new life now and always. Let us pray. We give you thanks, most gracious God, for sending Jesus, the light of the world, to help us find our way through earthly and spiritual challenges into the new life you offer, found in Jesus Christ. With Jesus' Holy Spirit as our guide and strength, we will persist in working through the challenges we face to make this world a better place. May our hearts and minds be open to your wisdom as we worship today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Gus. That was absolutely beautiful. Our scripture reading today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. 
Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Through the reading of this scripture, may you hear the word of God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation that comes from those words be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It has been my experience that some scripture passages are much easier to preach on than others. And I must admit that this particular passage is one of the difficult ones. In fact, I'm not alone in thinking this, as each one of the theologians in the commentaries I checked totally agree with this way of thinking. Through scripture, prayer, and worship, most Christians see Jesus as kind, gentle, compassionate, and loving. It's rather a shock to have Jesus depicted in this story as almost opposite to the Christian way of seeing him. However, we do know that Jesus went to extreme lengths to get a point across, teaching his disciples in sometimes radical ways that God's love is much bigger than we think. If we see humans as thinking inside the box, following the strict rules of our upbringing due to our culture, then God's way of thinking is outside the box and goes way beyond it. In fact, God's way of thinking is divine, and there is no way we could ever fully comprehend it as we are human. But Jesus, on the other hand, was fully divine and fully human. Jesus was and is Emmanuel, meaning God with us. He understood his people, his disciples and followers, and he understood God. Now, these are my thoughts based on my own Bible and commentary reading with some reflection. So I'm explaining them in my own way. Many people read scripture and it speaks differently to each of them each time. The way I interpret something may not be the way someone else interprets the very same passage. And that's okay. No one is right or wrong. Even theologians, after studying the cultures of Jesus' time on earth, as well as the historic events that took place then, often come up with varying perspectives on what a particular passage is saying. So what I'm saying today 
After my exploration of this scripture and several commentaries by different theologians, is what I perceive the Holy Spirit is saying to me to help you understand this scripture. As I said earlier, Jesus was often radical in his way of teaching, preaching, and doing his mission and ministry. For one thing, Jesus was always spending time with his own people, the Jewish people, but mainly with those who were on the margins of life, those who were ill with disease, poor, or the tax collectors, and those who were seen as sinners. This was part of his ministry, and he taught his disciples to, to do the same. Spend time with and heal, whether physically or spiritually, those who were down and out. But it was these people that his own culture tried to keep away from because they were considered unclean. They believed it would harm their own faith, their relationship with God, if they came in contact with them. This was the culture Jesus was raised in, but he tried to open their eyes to preach and teach the things that he knew God was sending him to do, to love God and love all of God's creation, and to bring back the lost sheep of the house of Israel into the fold, for they had wandered off the direct path that led to God. That was his main mission, his purpose for coming to earth. He was sent by God to reconcile God's chosen people back to God. This way of looking at his encounter with the Canaanite mother may help us understand Jesus' initial reaction to her. Now, the history of the Canaanites and the Israelites, which were Jesus' ancestors, was not good. After Moses led the Israelites for 40 years in the desert, Joshua led them into the land of Canaan, where they dispossessed the people living there. So, needless to say, they did not get along. Plus, their cultures and religions were totally different, so they wouldn't normally meet and have a conversation especially since the cities of Tyre and Sidon were not places that many Jewish people resided. At that time, it was mainly Gentiles, like the Canaanite woman. Another reason they would not get along is the fact that she was a woman. Back in Jesus' day, women were considered second-class citizens, along with children, especially if they were of a different culture. I guess you can see that we haven't come all that far, since today we still have racism. We still have people that are not accepted by others, whether it's because of their culture, religion, sexual orientation, gender, skin color, or the shape of their eyes. To make a long story short, I believe Jesus was making a point to his disciples, who seemed very annoyed about this woman who wouldn't leave them alone. She wouldn't go away. According to their culture and upbringing, they were not supposed to interact with her, which could be the reason why Jesus was silent at first. It seemed like he was ignoring her, but to her credit, she was persistent. Even though she was calling out to Jesus, perhaps even shouting in the beginning, which wasn't considered appropriate, she did call him Lord. Although this may have been just another term for sir. However, she did call him son of David, which might lead us to believe that she knew who Jesus was. Perhaps she had even learned of his amazing ability to heal. 
And since her child was in desperate need of healing, she was willing to go to any length to be heard. After the disciples urged Jesus to send her away, Jesus replied, probably within her hearing, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As I said earlier, Jesus' culture, which was the same for his disciples, and his particular upbringing was ingrained in him to the point that he could only respond in this way to her request. But then she came and knelt before him in a humble and prostrate posture, which denotes respect for Jesus. And gently she said, Lord, help me. Jesus' metaphorical answer, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs, was referring to Jesus using his time and the Holy Spirit's power for someone other than those he was sent for, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Perhaps in his mind, the mission had to be completed first. Although Jesus had made one exception in an earlier encounter in the book of Matthew, when he healed a centurion's servant. Let's just say he wasn't making it a priority to open his ministry to Gentiles before his mission to Israel was completed. However, his insult, referring to her as a dog, meaning someone much less than important than his own people, and his comment, sorry, meaning someone much less important than his own people, and his comment about the children of Israel being the only recipients of his ministry, did not deter her from challenging Jesus to look beyond the norm and make a change for the better. A just cause in her mind, for everyone has a right to receive love and medical care that could prevent them from dying. In her case, her beloved daughter was worth the risk of antagonizing this man, for if she didn't try to get him to see her way, her daughter would perish anyway. She showed great love and great faith in Jesus' ability to heal. For her reply, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table, was positive and hopeful, perhaps even an eye-opener for Jesus and his disciples. In other words, she was willing to take what she could get to help her daughter live even going so far as to put her trust and faith, her, a Canaanite woman, in a Jewish rabbi, whose culture and faith normally despised the Canaanites. And Jesus, whether he was sparring with her all along to get to this point so he could teach his disciples a much-needed lesson, or whether he actually changed his mind because of her amazing faith, her boldness in pursuing what she thought was a just cause, and her persistence in wanting what was right for her daughter, caused Jesus to praise her great faith and grant her wish, healing her daughter instantly. This was something new and remarkable, that Jesus would tear down the dividing wall between his culture and the Canaanite mother's culture, and bless her by granting her request. And perhaps this encounter with a non-Jewish woman was one small incident that opened a far greater blessing for all people. Perhaps it was foreshadowing a time to come when Jesus' love and mercy through the presence of the Holy Spirit would be offered to all people a light to the nations. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, 
God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah about the Messiah he would send in the future. He said, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. The end of Matthew's gospel reinforces this prophecy. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 22, Jesus gives his disciples the Great Commission. It takes place after Jesus' death and resurrection to new life, when he appeared to his disciples and many followers, just before he ascended into heaven. Jesus said these words, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. These wonderful and encouraging words tell me that Jesus' plan all along was to include all peoples of the earth in his offer of unconditional love, forgiveness, and new life. He just had to concentrate before his death on the mission to his own people. And after that was accomplished, and after he had died on a cross and risen to new life himself, he would open up the invitation to all non-Jewish people, all peoples of the earth, to seek him, show great faith in the process, and receive his blessing of new life. So you see, you and I have benefited from Jesus' unusual encounter with the Canaanite mother. If we seek Jesus, talk to Jesus, listen to him, and pour out our concerns and requests to him, then in turn, Jesus will listen to us and through his loving Holy Spirit will give us direction, strength to get through difficult times, persistence in working for what is right, and a chance to grow our faith. This goes for individuals as well as faith communities. And if we step out of our comfort zones to tear down dividing walls of racism or show others we care by volunteering for important ministries like food banks, shelters, or after-hours programs at schools, just to name a few, we will be doing the mission and ministry of Christ. As well, another way to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world is to give financially to the United Church of Canada's Mission and Service Fund, which helps others around the world in times of great need, like famine, or aiding places that are suffering from natural disasters, or even unexpected explosions, such as happened in Beirut recently. There are many ways to love and honor God through the work we do as followers of Christ. If we seek Jesus and listen for guidance, we'll know what to do. And then, like the Canaanite woman, we'll understand that God's love through Jesus Christ is meant for everyone. And that's the greatest blessing of all. Thanks be to God. Let's continue to praise God as we sing together him from more voices, 171, Christ has no body now but yours.
our offering, a loving response to God's good and gracious gifts to us, is one small way to show our love to God. God's gift of love to the world is Jesus Christ and the new life he offers to everyone. So it is with thankful hearts that we offer God our love through our time, talent, and financial contributions that help us carry out the mission and ministry Jesus gave us to do, like tearing down the unjust walls of racism. Woodlawn United Church is dedicated to living out Christ's mission and ministry, and we are grateful to everyone who gives as they are able to ensure his mission and ministry continues through Woodlawn United Church. Thank you for being the body of Christ in the world. Let us sing together our offertory response from Voices United 537, Your work, O God, needs many hands. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for your eternal love and guiding presence through Jesus Christ that helps us tear down racial walls of hatred and build up God's loving kingdom here on earth. We are blessed that you care for us and offer us the hope of a better future. In love, we offer our gifts to you and ask for your blessing upon them so they may be used wherever they are needed. May our offerings shine the light of your loving countenance through Jesus Christ and bring hope to the world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Following a new creed, I'll offer a blessing. We'll sing, go now in peace, and then Gus will play a postlude. Let us say a new creed together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are all to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect and creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. As we leave our worship today, may God bless and keep us, guiding us by the Holy Spirit to sense God's loving presence through Jesus Christ and helping us to tear down the dividing walls of racism. And may the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and always. Amen.